this webinar is part of the Wilder Future for Warwickshire project, um, which is a two-year program that's looking at uh, practical conservation and ecology along with uh, marketing communications, campaigning um, and social media to raise awareness about key conservation issues and to motivate others to make a difference. Um, if you're not part of the Young Adult Ambassador Programme and you'd like some more information on it, then please feel free to drop me an email. Um, I can send you some more details and if you're interested in signing up, we are more than happy to have you. Um, usually I would do some kind of introduction about spiders and Watch Wildlife Trust, but having spoken to various colleagues today, it turns out I do not have all that much to tell you because we do not currently have a spider expert at the Trust. Um, so from that, I am just going to pass straight over to Richard, uh, who is going to be running the webinar for us today on spiders. Um, so, Richard. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, welcome. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Lovely to see you all here. Uh, it's always fantastic to have a, a captive audience to be able to talk about spiders. They're a, a true passion of mine, and I really think they should be a true passion for everybody out there. I know there are a group of animals for which many people don't have a great deal of love. And this is somewhat of a shame because they're actually ecologically extremely important. And also when you get to know them, rather beautiful, not only in terms of their appearance, but also in terms of their, their behavior. They're really, really quite fascinating. Many of them have a very, very gentle side. They're excellent parents. Some of them will even cohabit. You get males and females living together in, in harmony. There really are so many myths that need to be dispelled about these amazing eight-legged critters. So I hope you enjoy the presentation and the, the webinar that we have for you this evening. If you do have any questions, there will be opportunities for you to ask. Um, I'm quite happy for people to pop questions in uh, through the chat during the session. Uh, and I'm sure that Joanna is going to uh, make sure that I don't miss anything as we go through. Uh, and also there is a, a dedicated opportunity for questions and answers at the end as well. Um, Oh, there was something else. I was, ah, that's it. A break. There will be a break around about the halfway mark as well. We'll go for coming on for an hour. We'll take a short break uh, just to keep everybody mentally fresh and give you the chance to nip off and get yourself a quick cup of, of coffee or tea or whatever you need uh, to keep yourself going for the second hour. Uh, and then we shall we shall crack on. So without any further ado, uh, please do indulge me whilst I jump into the wonderful world of spiders. <laughs> uh, hopefully everybody can see my screen now uh, can you that's fantastic excellent now you can see right off we've got a rather cracking specimen here uh, this is the ladybird spider this is the male uh, of the ladybird spider Eresa sandaliatus this is a, a species which is it's more common on mainland europe although we do get them in very, very few locations in the United Kingdom. Um, they're highly protected. They are critically endangered in this country. Um, but they are, I'm sure you'll agree, rather striking animals. You can see why they're called ladybird spiders. The males have this wonderful black um, spotting on the red abdomen. The females actually are just black. Uh, they're somewhat larger, quite chunky spiders, and they're really, really sensitive to disturbance. Uh, quite amazing animals. So there you go. Not all spiders are just black and long and leggy. Uh, spiders, I'm going to give you a little bit of a natural history. Uh, we're going to look at uh, a range of different species and behaviours. Uh, I'll uh, talk to you a little bit about sampling and when you can get information and decent books that you can look up as well to take this further. Uh, before we go any further, I'm going to I'm going to hang my hat out for you just to just to make things clear, because like I say, I know a lot of people have concerns about spiders. They feel a little uncomfortable about them. If I tell you that a lot of people get into arachnology because they um, they're actually not comfortable with spiders to start with, but they want to overcome that fear. So they start looking deeper uh, and suddenly they find themselves um, enraptured by this amazing world of extraordinary animals. And that's, um, you know, that's a story which we see repeated again and again and again. And that's the thing is once they get hold, you really will find that they hold your fascination uh, and they reward patient 
study. And the lovely thing about working with spiders is you can study them throughout the year. My field work takes me out in December, January, even under uh, conditions where we've got thick snow or hard frost. And you don't have to look very hard before you'll find that just underneath the crust of the snow and the frost, there's a thriving community of invertebrates and still active spiders there as well. So spidering is something you can do 12 months a year. You can do it 24 hours a day. In fact, there's quite a lot to see if you go out in the evening with a torch that you won't see during the day. So, you know, it's extremely rewarding from that point of view. Just to throw some numbers at you, there are over 40,000 species of spiders worldwide that have been identified so far. And in the United Kingdom alone, we have more than 670 species. So actually, this was what got me excited and studying spiders in the first instance. I actually started out working with reptiles in ecology uh, and looking at, at reptile ecology is fantastic when you're working overseas in the tropics where there are large numbers of um, lizards and snakes and, and all sorts of other amazing reptiles. When you come back to the UK, we have a handful of species and most of the theories that I'd been working on overseas, I just couldn't apply them in the UK in the same way with reptiles. Stepping over to spiders gave me immediately 670 specimen species that I could work with. Um, and, you know, I'm never bored. Uh, I'm never out of work because of that. You know, there are, uh, there's always a need for someone who knows something about spiders. So there are, you know, even potentially uh, careers in the study of spiders as well. So, I'm sure you're all familiar with the nursery rhyme of uh, Little Miss Muffet. Uh, we can see Little Miss Muffet sitting on her tuffet. What a lot of people may not be aware of is the fact that Little Miss Muffet was a real person. Um, in fact, her father, Thomas Muffet, uh, was a, a, a very, very famous arachnologist, passionate about spiders. And you can see here uh, a few uh, lovely little quote from him that I can't quite see the corner of because I've got the... Uh, the images to the side. Anyway, uh, just to sort of paraphrase for you, this was Thomas Muffet. The skin of it, that is the spider, is so smooth, soft, smooth, polished and neat that she precedes the softest skinned maids and the daintiest and most beautiful strumpets and is so clear that you may almost see her face in her as in a glass. She hath fingers that the most gallant virgins desire to have theirs like them, long, slender, round, of exact feeling that there is no man nor any creature that can compare with her. Thomas Muffet was obsessed with spiders. He really, really was. He studied the use of spiders for um, folk medicines, for example, um, and he even believed in eating spiders. It was said that um, if you spread a spider lightly bruised on a piece of toast and ate that, it had medicinal value. I'm not convinced, I have to say. And um, the, the story goes that actually Thomas Muffet's daughter wasn't impressed either because he often would experiment on his daughter, feeding her various spider-based concoctions and, and so on. Uh, so therefore the idea of, of uh, little Miss Muffet sitting on her tuffet um, being so terrified of spiders is because she was probably traumatised, poor girl, um, by her rather obsessive but rather interesting father. Um, spiders in folklore actually have been tied in with many, many different practices. We can see here this is obviously not a real spider, but it was common practice in the Middle Ages, for example, for people to try and trap a spider inside uh, a walnut shell. Uh, they'd bind the walnut shell and they would wear that as a necklace around their neck because they believed that it would ward off illness. Not very good for the spider and sadly it didn't really have any particular benefits for the people who wore them around their necks either. Um, so it doesn't work but again and again through history we see spiders being associated um, with good luck for example um, or with medicinal benefits and we'll see a little bit more on that later. There are a whole range of different arachnids that we will see around the world uh, and also in the UK. Certainly in Britain, we have all of the above. We have scorpions, uh, Euscorpius flavicordus, uh, reasonably common in parts on the south coast. We have a, a, a whole raft of species of mites and ticks. 
in the British Arachnological Society, we don't really study mites and ticks. We leave that uh, to other people because they're a you know, specialist topic of their own right. Uh, pseudoscorpions, they're all around us in the compost, in the soil. Um, tiny, tiny, amazing little predators. Pseudoscorpions actually do have venom, but they don't have a sting. Their venom is in glands contained in their claws. Um, and they're able to uh, feed on all sorts of tiny invertebrates within uh, the, the, the top layer of the soil. Uh, plenty of harvestmen, as we can see here with this lovely example, and of course, a 670 plus species of spiders. It's spiders I'm going to be uh, occupied with this evening. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with the differences between spiders and insects. So spiders have two body regions or body parts as opposed to insects which have three. The big difference really is spiders, they combine both the head and the thorax. They have what we call a, a cephalothorax um, in one. Spiders have no antennae, although some people do think they can see antennae. What they can actually see is uh, organs we can call pedipalps, which we'll be coming on to in a minute. Uh, insects generally have one pair of antennae. Spiders, as we know, four pairs of legs as opposed to the uh, three for insects. And then there's the pedipalps. So pedipalps are amazing. They're like an extra pair of legs, really. I suppose you could see them as arms at the front. Uh, they're sensory. Uh, they're often used for signaling uh, from uh, the male spider to the female, for example. Um, they're used for prey capture and they're also crucially used for mating as well. And that's important for us because they can actually be used to help us identify to a species level. We know that spiders have venom. Well, most species do actually. There are a few that have no venom, but the vast majority of spider species have venom. This is contained in glands um, that feed through the fangs on the head, on the cephalothorax. Insects, if they have venom, it's typically present in a sting or in a spray, but with spiders, it's exclusively um, through fangs. So therefore, it's incorrect if you ever see people referring to being being stung by a spider. You will see this in the newspapers from time to time. Spiders cannot sting. Uh, they can only bite. And they'll only do that as an absolute last resort. And if you think about it, that makes perfect sense. Because spider venom is essential to them. It's their principal means of overpowering their prey. Um, and it's also used to help process their prey so that they can suck up a liquid soup, if you like, because they can't eat solids either. I mean, they're quite pathetic animals in many respects. Um, so they need, to, they need to convert their prey into a soup which they can suck up. Now, venom is quite expensive for them to make. And if you've got something which you're absolutely dependent on for your life, and it's expensive for you to make more of it, you're going to conserve it, aren't you? So the vast majority of cases where a spider might bite a human being, um, they do what we call a dry bite. And that is they will, they'll use their fangs to nip at you uh, to say, Oi, you're going to kill me, please back off. And that's exactly what it is. It's a warning. So they want to give you a sharp pinprick to make you back off quickly. But they don't inject any venom. They don't want to inject venom because they might need that uh, to keep feeding. Um, and in fact, they'll only inject venom when they're, they're, they're really, really desperate. So if they think, you know, they may be in real danger of death. Um, so it's an absolute last resort. And, you know, um, one of my colleagues in uh, Canada, uh, she's one of the world's leading experts on black widows. They've done experiments on, on trying to provoke black widow females into biting rubber fingers so they can inject the venom harmlessly into a, into a rubber finger. And what they've discovered is that you really, really have to go at them. So if you just gently bump them, they'll give a little dry nip to say, please leave me alone. I don't want to do anything more. Um, and if you really, really press at them, only then will they typically inject venom. So spiders will do everything in their power most of the time to avoid actually using venom when they're biting humans. And usually they'll try not to bite. Those big, scary house spiders that people see, the classic spider in the bath, if you press them against your skin, and I'm not recommending this because there's a risk of damaging the poor thing, they're quite fragile. Um, we've actually seen them trying to turn their head away. Uh, they don't want to bite. They're desperately trying to avoid doing that. Um, and even then, when they do, they're barely capable of breaking the human skin. 
Um, so like I say, they're, they're quite pathetic and not worth the terrible reputation they often have. Um, it's normal for us to refer to venom when we're referring to spiders. Venom is contained something that's injected typically through bite or in the case of insects a sting. Poison is something which would do you harm if you were to consume it. And most spiders are not poisonous, though they are venomous. Although there are exceptions to that, as I'll come to later. We know spiders don't have wings. They do have simple eyes, usually four, six or eight eyes. There are some blind spiders that have no eyes, including the, the rarely, rather bizarrely named no-eyed, big-eyed wolf spider. How can you be no-eyed and big-eyed? Uh, well, it's because they're, they're from a group called the big-eyed wolf spiders, but these ones live in caves and have lost their eyes over many years of evolution. Um, spiders always have silk apparatus on the, the tip of the abdomen. Some insects do, uh, but only in their larval stages and are only in the head end of the body. In terms of development, you're probably familiar with insects having larval stages, pupil stages. Some uh, with incomplete metamorphosis have nymphs. Spiders don't have any larval stage. So baby spiders or spiderlings are basically miniatures of the adults. They change proportion and they change colour, but actually there isn't a great deal of, um, of physical change uh, apart from that. So study of spiders actually is still relatively new. We can see uh, one of the first exponents of true arachnology here. This is Martin Lister, Spider-Man. Um, so this is his, his great work, um, Arrhenaeus, Tractatus to Arrhenaeus, uh, dating from 1678. He was one of the first people to try and catalogue all of the species in Britain. And he came to a count of around about 30. And he even wrote rather confidently in his book that I do not believe that there are any other species that people can discover in this country. Uh, he said, like I say, around about 30, 31 species. Today we're at 670. So um, Martin, great start, but a little bit of a way to go. I don't suppose you could flick the light on for me, could you please? Um, so, uh, we can't really blame him though, because a lot of the distinctions that we make between spider species today are on tiny, tiny features um, that do require you to have a decent eyeglass or even a microscope to be able to see more closely. But we have a great debt of gratitude to Martin Lister because he did get us started. And in fact, he even came up with a binomial system for naming species, a bit like that, that Linnaeus came up with. Of course, we stuck with the Linnaean system rather than Martin Lister's. That's probably because Lister's used what we would call the genus name and then a number, whereas um, Linnaeus came up with two names, which is much more easy for people to work with. Throughout the 20th century, we can see some more modern Spider-Men, so to speak. Um, I keep referring to Spider-Men because historically most of the people who've worked with spiders have been male, but that has very much changed in recent years. In fact, most of the spider community that, I, uh, that I, I'm in contact with uh, internationally are female. There are an awful lot of, of women arachnologists these days, which is, is fantastic. And in fact, uh, a significant number of the um, council on the British Arachnological Society um, are women as well. So that, that has really shifted over the years. In the 20th century, it was predominantly a male occupation. So Lockett and Millage, over to the left-hand side of the slide, uh, wrote one of the first great spider ID um, books or it was actually a series of books we topped out with three um, volumes one and two which were just Lockett and Millage in 51 and 52. Then William Sire Bristow we can see to the right hand side wrote one of the most readable books still to this day The World of Spiders. Uh, now that was 1958. If you can find a copy of this in a second-hand bookshop, I recommend it. They're often going at a reasonably low price. You might pick one up for 10, 15 pounds. It's well, well worth it because he wrote in a really, really exciting style. Um, the reason we've got this picture of a, a common house spider underneath Bristow is just to point out to you something I was saying earlier. Uh, a lot of the people who study spiders actually came in with a fascination because they had an original fear. Uh, William Bristow never lost his fear of big house spiders. So even though he became one of the preeminent authorities on spiders worldwide, he conducted research in Malaysia, you know, literally, if you were anything to do with spiders, you knew about Bristow. 
he never ever got his over his fear of big house spiders so you know if you find these large spiders a little bit difficult sometimes they they can make um you know anyone jump because they're very very quick with their movement and they are you know they're the real real Usain Bolt of the spider world over the ground they're actually the fastest spiders so they are very very fast indeed um if they make you startle then you're in good company because Bristow was a true great and he always felt a little bit uneasy about the humble house spider. Um, more recently in the 1980s and 90s we got more accessible uh, books. Uh, these are a lot cheaper so you can still get the Field Studies Council uh, Key to the Families of British Spiders. It's quite a, uh, a small book. It's uh, or sort of leaflet really. Very very easy to use. Uh, very rich in diagrams. Uh, and then the Collins Field Guide in 1995. This was the one uh, that got me started. You can still buy this book today. It's that good. It just keeps going through uh, new printing. So you can see here when it was published 450 species in the UK. We're now on 670 and counting. So the numbers still keep going up. Um, also, Michael Roberts was responsible for the spiders of Great Britain and Ireland, a huge uh, two volume tome which really was detailed if you wanted to do anything to a high level for spider id that was what you needed it was reprinted in the 1990s in a paperback version again there were two parts part one was the text part two was the diagrams not cheap but it's completely free if you go on the world spider catalog uh, which you can join for free online so look up the world spider catalog if you're interested in this and you can actually get a full free pdf copy of Robert's Spiders of Great Britain and Ireland. However, by far the most attractive and the easiest to use book for field ID is this, Britain's Spiders a Field Guide. So this is the second edition published at the end of 2020 by my colleagues, uh, Lawrence B, Jeff Oxford and Helen Smith. And it's an amazing book. It's ever so um, well laid out. It's got fantastic photographic guides for the majority of species. Uh, it will give you information about their distribution, uh, key ca physical characteristics for you to look out for, whether you can identify them by eye, whether you need to use a hand lens or a microscope and pointers to take you further with that. It's an amazing book. It's a beautiful book and you can get lost in it for quite some time. I highly recommend it. So telling apart spiders by sex. Actually, it's quite easy to do by eye sexing of spiders. There are three characteristics that we can look out for. Uh, the first of those is the basic proportions. So if we have a look at the diagram, you can see that the, um, the head, the cephalothorax of the male um, is slightly larger relative to the abdomen than in the female. In the female, it's the abdomen that is definitely the larger part. Um, by quite some distance. So for any species, usually the abdomen is a little bit larger, um, but if it's notably larger, it's more likely to be a female. But what we're really looking for, because that can vary quite a bit, you can get skinny females who've not had much to eat, you can get males who've been really quite well fed, and their abdomen is actually quite soft, so it does stretch. Look for the pedipalps at the front, so that is what looks like two small short legs, um, and if you can see they're, they're swollen in this picture here, uh, they look like they've got boxing gloves on the ends. That is a mature male specimen. They're very, very easy to spot. You can spot that uh, by the naked eye very, very easily. The females do have pedipalps. Pedip we can see that on the female down here, uh, much, much smaller. And you can see they're not particularly swollen at the end. But for the female, if we were to turn her over, you notice that she actually has this um, rich, complex genital structure at the base of the abdomen uh, and that's very very important the male just has this furrow here but the female has a much more complex anatomy for her genitalia so for identifying spiders to species level we usually use the pedipalps for the males and what we call the epigyne for the females uh, so uh, that does require uh, a steady hand and a hand lens for the larger specimens or a microscope for the smaller specimens. But there are a number of species you can identify straight away by eye. They're relatively easy to spot. Uh, we can see, for example, on the left-hand side of the screen at the bottom, are the um, walnut spider, Nuctinea umbratica. Uh, these things are very active throughout the year. 
Uh, you can see these in December, January, still spinning their webs quite actively. Uh, they tend to come out only at night. They're very, very flat. So they hide under bark, for example, in the day or in very small nooks and crannies. Larinioides uh, cornutus. This is the bridge spider up at the top. Uh, you'll find these in dark places or underneath bridges quite commonly. And they build some large orb webs that are quite beautiful to see. And again, they tend to be more active at night. Spider ID is uh, it's a real science and it's a, it's a wonderful thing to get into. I mentioned that anatomy, that complex anatomy for the female genitalia, and that's what you can see at the left hand side. So up at the top, uh, we have the top of the screen, we have the garden cross spider or the garden spider. This is Araneus diadematus. Um, and we can see at the left hand side, that is the female's epigyne. Uh, so you can see the differences between um, that one and the species below, Araneus quadratus. You can see it's quite similar, but notice to the sides, the structures are somewhat different. And also notice that the end of this structure um, is a little bit more bulbous for diadematus than is for quadratus. For the males, the pedipalps, that's the structure you can see uh, somewhat in the middle of the screen. Again, you can see there's quite a lot of differences between the two sexes, but you can only really study that with a decent high quality hand lens or a microscope. Um, but the differences even include the location and position of their hairs. Um, and we can see some very, very complex structures here. These are used for delivering sperm into the female. So it is a copulatory organ that we can see here. And that, if I just go back a slide, is what's contained in this bulbous structure here. So the complex, the detailed bits you can see, you would only see if you could see from the side, from the top. It just looks slightly swollen like a boxing glove. Internal anatomy for a spider is so different from that that we would see in uh, most other animal species. So we can see there are a number of different features of interest. You can see the mouth is literally just a hole. Food is sucked up the mouth and goes through into uh, what we call the sucking stomach. Now the sucking stomach isn't actually a true stomach. It doesn't hold on to anything. It just pulses. Um, almost like a heart to create suction, which draws the liquid food in. That's then passed further in. If we trace that round, you can see in the center of the abdomen, the gut, and we can see these various different weird structures like branches coming off in the middle, uh, the mid gut. This actually is where the food is digested. It significantly increases the surface area for digestion. Uh, the brain is actually located underneath the stomach. Uh, so rather different to, to our own. We can see the poison gland or poison duct here. There's the gland, there's the duct down to the fangs. Should strictly be called a venom duct, but um, a lot of people still refer to it as poison. The book lung, you can always see if you turn a spider over, there are two pale patches, sometimes four pale patches that are visible, depending on the species you're looking at. And this is the book lung, so that's the gap in and these are a series of plates. So they're actually, in a sense, they're more like human lungs than the spiracles that we see classically in insects. Um, their anatomy is, is very, very different, very, very alien uh, from our own. And actually, if you can see uh, this nerve mass here, we can even see um, that the, uh, the nerves actually go down. We can see elements of the brain going down into the upper part of the legs as well. Quite extraordinary. I'm assuming if anyone has any questions, you will put it into the chat as we go. Okay, just going to check on where we're at for time. Good. Silk. Silk is kind of the defining feature of all spiders, actually. It's ecologically which sets them, what sets them apart from all other living animals. Um, it really is quite extraordinary stuff as well. Spider silk is edible, for starters. So spiders, if you notice, there's a web there, uh, perhaps in the evening, and you go back the following day and it's gone. Uh, the spider has probably eaten the web. It re-ingests the web because it can, it can use that protein. It doesn't want to waste it, doesn't want to lose it. It can, uh, can utilise that once again. So they'll eat their webs and then they'll spin themselves a new web. No resource uh, should be wasted. Um, it's also waterproof, although it does tend to, they, they lay a glue over the top of the sticky spirals, which absorbs water. 
It is, it's famous for having a stronger tensile strength than steel. It's unimaginably strong, actually. I've got some lovely stats for you in a couple of minutes just to show you how strong spider silk is. And when you consider how thin it is, how fragile it is, it's even more extraordinary. The gluey strands are even stickier than sticky tape. And spider silk itself is much stretchier than any elastic. It doesn't rot either. It's really the perfect biomaterial. In fact, there's a lot of research today into looking whether we can synthesize spider silk, because if we could synthesize spider silk, we could manufacture it for our own purposes. One teaspoonful of spider silk is enough to make one million spider webs. And if you had only 500 grams of spider silk, you could spin a thread that could circumnavigate the entire globe. Because spiders use their silk so effectively for prey capture, we can also safely say that spider webs and spider silk are na nature's safest insecticide. Um, and this is something that actually the Chinese have known about for some time. Uh, if you have a look, uh, you can see that uh, Chinese agriculturalists going back in history would build what we might see as bivouacs within the fields to encourage spiders to go in there um, and then the spiders could radiate out from there to be able to predate in the fields. Um, so actually there's quite a lot to be said for making agriculture more spider friendly because it's a fantastic way to control pests. And we're actually learning more and more about just how, how effective they are at controlling pests to this day. Uh, some research I conducted with uh, an associate of mine out in India recently um, led to us discovering a spider species that feeds on insect eggs. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later because it's really, really interesting and it's very different from what most people imagine for spiders. They tend to imagine them snaring prey in webs or, or following prey that's moving. But actually they can hunt down things like eggs and that's important. Um, webs also use electrostatic charges to snare their prey. So when uh, a, a flying insect flies, because its wings are moving so rapidly, it actually generates a slight positive electrical charge when it's flying. And spider webs have the opposite charge. So as, a, as an insect flies past the spider's web, the spider web actually stretches out a small distance and the, the insect is also magnetically drawn the other way. So it actually attracts the insect to it. Uh, an insect actually can't fly too close to a spider web without getting drawn into the web itself. They're really quite amazing things. Silk is about one one hundredth the diameter of a human hair. And that's what we can see on this electromicrograph here. So you can see the human hair. The human hair is like a tree trunk. It's enormous. Of course, human hairs are tiny, tiny fibers around about 0.04 millimeters in diameter. But we can see the silk strand just draped elegantly over the top of it here. You can see just how much smaller that silk strand is. And bear that in mind when we start thinking about just how strong that spider silk is. So if you've got a large flying insect that, that gets drawn into a web and gets trapped, it's being held by these tiny, tiny strands. And yet, held it is. To stop a human from falling, you only need the silk of a web to be one millimetre in diameter. That's it. A one millimetre thickness of silk is enough to stop a human falling. It's quite extraordinary. But what about if we extrapolate? Let's make it even bigger. How about if you wanted to stop a jumbo jet? What kind of a spider's web would we need to trap a jumbo jet? Well, actually, not that thick. If a spider could spin silk, spin a web, the diameter of the human finger, it would be capable of trapping a jumbo jet. That's quite an amazing feat for us to just think about. So when we say that spider silk has a higher tensile strength than steel, we can really imagine it because it's so incredibly strong, so elastic, so incredible at its specialist purpose of being able to ensnare prey. But it's not just prey capture that they use that silk for. Everywhere a spider goes, everywhere it wanders, it leaves behind it a drag line. 
that drag line is particularly tough silk. And that's because if that spider gets into danger, it can just jump, it can parachute away. So if it's on a branch, it can just drop off the branch, hanging onto the drag line, and it will be able to climb back up once the threat has passed. Jumping spiders, when they jump, they use the silk, the drag line, they're still attached to the ground, but they use that, they actually pull on that to be able to control the angle of their flight. So a jumping spider, as it jumps, it can tense muscles in its abdomen to control the, ten the, um, the tension on that drag line silk, and it can change the angle so that it falls short, um, or it goes further, or whatever. They're amazing creatures, the way they use that drag line silk. It, drag line silk has no real validity in terms of prey capture, but it's everything for spider safety and also for controlling spider jumps. So we can see here some different uses of silk. Top left, we can see a classic orb web spider in the center of its web. Top right, we can see an orb web spider and that's using silk for wrapping. So silk that's used to wrap prey is different from the silk that's used to make the web. It's actually secreted from different glands or within the spinnerets. So actually they use different spinnerets for spinning the webs, the, the, the silk for the webs, and for spinning the um, silk that they use for shrouding uh, their prey when they've captured it. And for dragline silk, a different set of spinnerets once again, and so on. Bottom left, we can see a lovely candy striped spider. And we can see that actually she has an egg sac here. That's the bluish thing underneath. A different kind of silk once again. This is very good for controlling the environment for her developing eggs and also providing protection for those developing eggs as well. And finally, we can see a tiny little spiderling here. This is shooting out silk. Uh, this is used for ballooning or parachuting. So they'll release silk into the air on um, even a day with a very, very gentle breeze. That's enough just to catch that silk and to carry them potentially for very many miles. Are you all familiar with the, uh, the famous eruption of the uh, Krakatoa volcano uh, in Southeast Asia? It was a volcanic eruption in the 19th century, so powerful, it was said to be heard in the United Kingdom, literally the other side of the world, completely destroyed the island of Krakatoa, wiped out all life on it. And yet the first life that was seen to recolonize Krakatoa hundreds of miles from the mainland were spiders who had been carried there by parachute silk. The joke is that they were there waiting for the insects when they arrived later. And in actual fact, I say a joke, but it's worth bearing in mind that spiders were amongst the first, or rather arachnids were amongst the first animals to crawl out of the water and adopt a truly terrestrial lifestyle. In fact, we know that they were out and active on land before even the insects had got there. So there's good evidence to suggest that the spiders were indeed there, ready and waiting for when the insects emerged as well. And in fact, we could even extrapolate further and suggest that the danger that spiders were manifesting on the ground with their early snares was partly responsible for insects maybe taking the wing. And insects taking the wing is intimately associated with the evolution of flowers. So when you're outside and you have a look at the cavalcade of different colours, wild flowers or different flowers in your garden, if we just think back to the evolution of spiders and we may owe it all to those creatures that terrify so very, very many people. Spider silk is not without its uses as well. For many, many years, in fact, right through in the 20th century as well, it was used for optical instruments. So we can see here from 1896, what was called a Spider-Man, his job was to fit a tiny piece of spider silk in the eyepiece of an instrument. Spider silk was used, for example, for the sights for guns or for cameras, um, was used for very, very ma many fine scale um, uh, optical instruments used by industry as well. These days we can make almost equivalent um, artificial strands that we can use for those instead. So, you know, the job of the spider man uh, to actually fit spider silk in optical instruments is sadly gone, but um, actually we owe them a very great debt. 
Yes, you can even make clothes out of spider silk. Now, that amazing yellow dress, that's not dyed. Um, that is actually the natural colour, and that has been spun from spider silk, nothing else. So this is spider silk from uh, Nephila madagascariensis. It's quite a large orb weaving spider. You can see a couple up at the top um, right hand side of your screen. Uh, a lot of people it would, you know, quite understandably be a little bit in awe of those spiders, feel maybe a little bit uncomfortable. Uh, they're actually quite harmless. Uh, they could give you a nip, but it's not enough to do you any real harm. Nothing worse than a, a wasp sting or something like that. And they, they actually don't like to bite anyway. They're, they're very, very docile. But they spin this amazing golden silk. And because of their large size, it's so thick. And you can see here it's been used to weave this amazing dress four years in the making, really painstaking work, used 1.2 million spiders that were milked for their silk. So you can imagine why um, you know, it took them four years. The estimated cost for this is 300,000 uh, UK pounds. And it was exhibited in the Victoria and Albert Museum between the 25th of January and the 5th of June in 2012. And you can see the, um, the um, design actually incorporated the spider itself as well. A lovely um, representation of the spider in its own silk. So yeah, you can make clothes out of spider silk. It's not particularly economical uh, because it does take an awful lot of spiders and an awful lot of time. But uh, I hope that um, you will agree with me. It's quite a beautiful thing. Not the sort of thing I would wear of an evening, um, but nevertheless, quite amazing. Not just clothes, but we can see here, Professor Shigeyoshi Asaka, uh, he actually spun and then strung a violin. And we can see, if you look closely, you can see that those strings are slightly yellow. And that's because it's from another species of Nephila. This is Nephila maculata, uh, which is common over in Japan. Um, again, these are not individual silk strands. It's many, many strands which have been woven together uh, to make the strings for the violin. So you can even play instruments that have been made using spider silk. Where are we doing for time? Spider webs are pretty much ubiquitous actually at the right time of year. You go out and you'll find them pretty much everywhere. Uh, quite beautiful things as well. Painstaking work. If you ever get the opportunity to watch a spider spinning a web, do take the time to watch because it's quite extraordinary the way that they do that. Uh, we can see there are a number of different types of webs, and this is something that you guys can um, employ actually straight away. Uh, you can do this at home, you can do this in your gardens. Uh, when we're able to go a little bit more further afield, uh, hopefully not too much longer before that, you'll be able to start spotting webs everywhere you go. Funnel webs, so this is the classic um, giant house spiders that people are familiar with and often so scared of. A very characteristic, you can see the funnel. The funnel is where the spider lives. It's very, very vulnerable. So remember the abdomen of a spider is actually quite soft. It makes them very vulnerable to predators. Um, and um, if you disturb that, they will run very, very quickly and hide in the funnel. Um, it's not sticky, a funnel web web. Um, it's spongy. If you can imagine uh, an insect walking across it, it's been compared to trying to walk across deep snow in the way that might feel. But also insects have all sorts of, of little spines and barbs on their legs and these will get caught in there and they'll literally just get trapped and tangled up in that without it needing to be sticky. But the spiders themselves, they're so quick across the web, it's a bit like they're wearing snowshoes. So they're much, much quicker and more agile across the sheet web, even though an insect in principle would be able to get free eventually. The spider is able to run out very, very quickly and pounce on it. And very quickly, they'll then drag those back in to the funnel because whilst they're out, they're vulnerable. Uh, we can see top right, these are lace webs. These are very common actually around um, hedgerows, outside sheds and things like that. Um, in dry stone walls, you'll see lace webs. Sometimes they look a bit bluish as well. Uh, these are amazing spiders that live in here. Again, this is not sticky silk. This is actually slightly woolly. If you look at this under a microscope, they have special combs that they use to fluff up the silk. Um, and it's, those, uh, it's that fluffiness that ensnares the spines on um, insect legs uh, that allows the spider to be able to come out and grab them. Lacewebs spiders are one of the few spiders that will actually happily tangle with a wasp. 
Um, this is principally because their strategy is to run out very quickly, grab the wasp by the front and then drag it quickly back into that hole. And because once they're in the hole, there's not very much room for the wasp to move, it can't curve its abdomen round to be able to sting the spider. Most spiders can't cope with wasps. Wasps are death to spiders. In fact, many wasps will predate on spiders. But lace webs can cope with them because of these very narrow funnels. Another spider species that can do that is Segestria. We can see that in the bottom right, these radial webs. They're very, very simple. So we can see a small hole, that's where you'd find the spider, but you can also see these faint silk lines just radiating out. And those are just trip wires. So if an insect walks past and walks across that, it will trip the trip wire, the spider races out, the, the, the insect isn't ensnared in any way, it's just the spider is so quick out and then back in that it can, it can grab the prey before the prey even knows what's happening. Um, and again, because it uses a very narrow um, burrow, if you like, this is just a tiny hole. Uh, again, it's a spider species which is capable of handling things like bees and wasps. In the middle, we can see a tangle web. If you look at tangle webs, they're completely chaotic, or at least they seem to be. The, the silk seems to go in all different directions, no rhyme or reason. They're completely three dimensional. Uh, they're actually incredibly effective. This is basically the type of web that black widows use in. Uh, the Americas, for example. Um, in this country, we have a raft of species that use them, including the much maligned, although not particularly um, dangerous false widow spiders. They use similar um, tangle webs as well. There are two ways that tangle webs work. One is that an insect trying to get through it, if it, if it gets in, it'll get knocked down um, by the total chaos of the tangle. Uh, and before it can actually get out of there, the spider will be able to run out and grab it. And the other is that some tangle webs and the false widows use, uh, sorry, the black widows use this approach, false widows do as well to a degree, is they have dangly gum foot lines that dangle from the tangle web with little blobs of glue on the end. And when an insect, perhaps on the ground, is wandering past, if it touches one of those globs of glue, then it just pulls it off the ground and it just hangs there a few millimetres above the ground, so it can't get in touch with the ground anymore. The spider can pull it up, it can reel it up and then bite it whilst it's helpless. So very, very effective. And actually because of that, animals like the black widow, uh, the redback in Australia and the false widow in the UK, they are actually capable of catching small vertebrates. Uh, generally, we're looking at things like small lizards. So they're really quite impressive, actually, given the small size of the spiders. Uh, and then on the bottom left, you can see sheet web spiders. You often see uh, you can often see sheet webs um, out in grasslands. You can see them in the um, in uh, the the remnants of tree stumps and things like that, uh, and through bushes and shrubs and, and and so on. So this is where you would find what most people would call money spiders, which are the most numerous spiders in the UK and one of the most numerous groups in the world. Um, sheet webs are, are rather clever actually. The spider hangs underneath the web upside down. Uh, the insect, again, you can see there's a bit of a tangle above, a bit like the tangle web. So the insect might try and fly past, it gets knocked down onto the top of the sheet. The spider bites it from underneath and is then able to um, overpower it and feed on it at its ledger. And I've seen tiny, tiny um, money spiders, linified spiders, um, overpowering much, much larger animals like house flies, a large house fly trapped in a sheet web. Although it's physically much more powerful than the spider, it can't actually escape because the spider is protected by the sheet web between it and the prey. And the, um, the spider is able to bite through that web through to the unprotected joints on the legs um, of the prey trapped just above. We can see again, this is the funnel web, large. Uh, we used to call these Tegenaria, but in 2011, they changed the name Eritigena um, because of uh, recognition of genetic similarities between species. Uh, we can see here, this one actually, you can see the, the reddish thing down here. Um, this is a, a small maggot, which has been fed to lure the spider out to be able to feed on it. If you want to be able to study these spiders, that's the easiest way. Drop some prey onto the web. You can do the same with orb webs. An orb web spider will come out of their little retreat if they're in hiding to feed on the prey. And that will give you time to observe them as well. 
You can also see, if I just click on, um, in the red circle, you can see some little white spots. This is spider frass. So if you like, that is, is spider um, waste or spider feces. Notice that it's all outside of the web. They're very, very clean animals. So they'll always get rid of the waste outside of the web. They keep their webs clean. They keep their homes clean. If you were to go down into the funnel um, where she lives, uh, this is a female one here, the male up here. Can you see the difference in the size of the abdomen? How much plumper hers is relative to his? But if you were to go down into the funnel, you'd find that she keeps a very very clean house indeed. And that's important because if you're not careful with your hygiene, that encourages bacteria and fungus and things like that. And that's, again, very dangerous for spiders. Some spiders don't build webs, or at least they don't build webs for prey capture. So we can see four examples of spiders that don't rely on webs for prey capture here. Top left, you can see one of my absolute favorite British species. This is the nursery web spider, Pissora mirabilis. Now, you guys do keep an eye out for these as you go through the year. As you get into uh, late May, June, July, look out for them. They're quite large, active spiders. They're, they're quite attractive specimens to see. Um, and in June, you will start to see their nursery webs appearing. I've got a picture of a nursery web later. But their webs are not used for prey capture. They're only for looking after their young. N uh, the nursery web spider, however, she hunts actively. Uh, so she prowls through the undergrowth, the grasses, and pounces like a cat on any invertebrates that she finds in there. Top right, this is the zebra spider, Salticus senecus. Um, an amazing species, jumping spider, very, very common. Um, actually, you can, you can almost get tame jumping spiders. If you see these, and you'll commonly see them in sunny days on uh, walls, you know, house walls, dry stone walls, things like that. Um, if you move your finger close to them and then move your finger like so, you'll find that they'll orient, they'll watch. They'll watch your finger. What they're doing is they're saying, is that a fly? Is that something I could jump onto? What is that? In actual fact, they're amongst the most intelligent invertebrates, shy of the, you know, the, the, the mollusks like octopuses or squid, which are very intelligent. But um, jumping spiders, incredibly smart. They actually have an ability to remember three-dimensional puzzles so that they can actually hunt prey out of sight of the prey. They can spot um, a prey item over here. They can be on a leaf the other side of a gap. And they can work out a route that takes them out of line of sight of the prey, come up behind it, and then jump on it. That's incredible cognition for, for an animal which really has just a few nerve ganglia for a brain. Incredible. Uh, and like I say, you can almost get them tame. Some people have actually trained them to take small invertebrate prey uh, that they offer to them on a little stick. Incredible animals. Bottom right, this is a crab spider, Missumina vatia. In North America, they're called goldenrods. You can see why. Beautiful, rich, yellowy golden color. Can be a little misleading because they also change color. They can change to green, they can change to white. It doesn't happen that quickly. It can take hours to a couple of days. But they will gradually change their color to merge with the colors of the uh, flowers that they're on. So you'll often find them on flowers that are yellow, white, or green quite nice that this one's on a pink flower because they can't mimic pink so it stands out really rather well there but maybe if you look carefully you can see that there's some pinkish coloration just there on the abdomen that's as much as they can do though bottom left we can see a wolf spider these are very active ground predators uh, they don't need webs they they wander they all of these spiders remember leave drag lines behind them but they're not used for prey capture so the wolf spider will creep close to its prey, and it'll then pounce very quickly. How are we doing for time? We're just coming up to uh, five two. And before we start to change topic, I'm thinking, first of all, good opportunity if anyone has any questions so far. And if we're done with questions, once we're done with that, we'll go for a five minute break. So over to you guys. Uh, there was a question in the chat 
um, asking about how spider webs evolved. Fantastic question. Excellent. Okay. So thank you very much to whoever asked that. Um, if you remember what I said um, a while ago, I said that uh, arachnids were amongst the first animals to actually adapt to fully terrestrial living. And evidence suggests that they were building, um, basically they would build, they would make little burrows for themselves that they could hide in and something would come past, they could jump out on that, possibly then start to lay trip lines. That possibly started by accident. Um, so we don't know exactly, we can't go back 500 million years to see what was going on. Um, but if you imagine the use of drag lines, um, a drag line, once it's gone into a burrow, actually leaves behind it um, a trip wire, effectively. Uh, spiders' primary sense is vibration. We do know that. Most of them have very, very poor eyesight indeed. So in all likelihood, they were living in their burrows. They'd left the drag line behind. Something walked across, triggered the drag line. That's a good signal there's something out there. So they pounce out. How do we get from that to a, uh, an orb web that we see in the horizontal plane suspended above the ground? Well, the next step in the evolution of spiders' webs is that you'll, you'll find species that build little turrets up from the ground. And they extend those radial lines down the side of the turret. One amazing thing is that flying insects, for example, tend to alight, they'll settle on surfaces which are slightly higher than the flat ground, because the ground is a dangerous place. So if you can spot something that gives you a vantage point, settle on that. So spiders start building turrets, prey start landing on the turrets, that makes sense. But also if you leave your drag lines down the side, you're also maintaining um, a sensory web, if you'll excuse the pun, but that's exactly what it is, that goes beyond that turret as well. And actually it's not too much then to imagine uh, a spider may be able to climb onto something else and that drag line then is stretched between the turret and perhaps an overhanging branch or leaf. Now it's very difficult for us to know exactly the sequence of events that occurred in spider web evolution but we believe that that's very much the way that they got started. From there we get horizontal webs, we get uh, sorry, we get uh, vertical webs, we get horizontal webs, uh, we get a whole different range. Things like the funnel webs probably came again from those turrets and then just spreading that funnel out as a sheet um, and so on. So I, I hope that answers your question. Got, uh, got another couple of questions. Um, right away. So we have, how would you handle a spider to ID it? Okay, excellent question. Right, um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a minute because it's probably better if you can see me large. Uh, let me stop. How do I do that? Mm -hmm. I don't know how to. Ah, excuse me. You'll have to. Ex can you see my, my picture? Um, the video feed for me. So if you can see that, what I'm holding up, this is something anyone can make. Uh, this is a pooter. Um, you can buy pooters um, online or through wildlife shops. I wouldn't recommend it. It's much easier to make your own if you can get yourself some clear plastic tubing. So um, firstly, they cost pennies to make. And secondly, these ones, the handmade ones, invariably work better than the ones you get from the shops. So we've got um, two lengths of plastic, one that is slightly thinner than the other and is of the same diameter to fit inside. Okay, so I take the long length, I just cut a little bit off the end, so it would originally have started like so. So I just cut that bit off. I cut a short length of the thicker diameter. I use a little bit of gauze, which I could get from netting or from stockings or tights or something like that kind of a material. I'll just fit that over the top of the long length of tube. I push on the shorter length, the fatter tube, and then I put the little thin end back in like so. Now I can insert this end into my mouth. I can breathe in. It exerts suction on the other end, which will draw the spider in to this thickened bit of tube. 
And quite often that's enough for me to be able to have a look or I can put it into another plastic tube or a, a glass vial so that I can have a look at that with my, with my hand lens or take that back to my home so I can study it in a bit more detail. So this is a pooter or aspirator. If you want to work with spiders, it's the best way to handle them. Spiders, you can handle them by hand, it's fine. Um, I don't recommend it, not because they're any threat to you, but because you're a threat to them. Firstly, remember their primary sense is vibration and a spider on your hand will feel um, your blood inside. It will feel your pulse. Um, it will feel if you're trembling slightly, that can be quite disconcerting for them. It's easier to hold them steady in something like this. They'll feel more comfortable in there as well. Um, secondly, because many of them are so fragile, there's a real risk if we're handling them um, that we might actually injure some of them as well. I mean, for large spiders, it's fine to let them wander across your hand. Um, that's not going to be too much of a risk. Um, but for some of the small specimens, like the, the money spiders, you're looking at something which may be uh, two, three millimetres across. Uh, and you could very easily damage it if you, if you weren't careful. So I generally work with a pooter when I'm working with uh, most UK species. If I'm working with anything larger, again, I'll try and trap it. Um, usually in a, a glass or a plastic container where I can then see that and then I can release it um, where I can. I always try to release um, specimens unharmed. Um, you know, obviously anyone working with wildlife would want to do that. Um, even where we're looking at things like tarantulas, and we don't get uh, the large tarantulas in the UK, um, but um, I'm not even that much in favour of handling tarantulas. Uh, and the reason, again, is, is very much for their welfare. Um, it's fine. They're, they're not really going to do you any harm. The vast majority of them are, are pretty much harmless. But they're large and they're reasonably heavy. And if you were to drop it, um, it's probably going to bleed to death because that soft abdomen ruptures very, very easily. And once it's ruptured, it's very difficult to do anything about that. And then you have a long lingering death for an animal that, that didn't need to be held in the first place. Secondly, um, if they feel like you might be about to drop them, they're really worried for their lives. So large tarantulas will hang on. And the, the best means they have to do that is with their fangs. So they'll, they'll dig the fangs in. They won't bite necessarily, but they'll try and just use them as picks to hold themselves steady. So, you know, although a lot of people do handle tarantulas, the reality is we do it for our satisfaction, not for the animal. And if we're not doing it for the animal and it's not good for the welfare of the animal, then, you know, my attitude is why do it at all? If we can study them, you know, in, in other ways, if we can get them in a, in a glass container, study them and then release them, I'd far, far rather do that. So usually in a, in a glass tube collected with a pooter, larger species you can catch in cups and, and so on. Hopefully we might get a chance to do this at some point. Oh, over. I'd love to. Yeah. Oh, so. Yeah. Um, another couple of questions, one from Daniel saying, um, are there any net catching spiders in the UK? Net catching spiders? Um, not as such. But then again, every web is a net. Uh, I think you're referring to things like the uh, sometimes referred to as the ogre, ogre eyed spider, uh, which we get in the tropics. They're amazing. Some people call them gladiator spiders. So they have a net uh, which they stretch um, and they, they put that over the prey. They're very, very um, incredible, actually, if you get to see that. And if we do run a field course later on in the year, um, I'll get some video footage that I can easily show you guys um, of uh, the, the Danopus, the ogre-eyed spider in practice, because it's amazing. We don't have any of those in the UK. Uh, but like I say, every web, every uh, classic web is in effect a net anyway. We do have some spiders that do interesting variations on that. Uh, we have a, a triangle spider, which is quite amazing. It holds its, its web under tension. It lets go and the web spins around and collapses on the prey. Um, we've got the, the various different webs that I, I showed you earlier as well. The, um, the tangle webs and, and the sheet webs, but no classic uh, net casting spiders, no. Um, okay, and then just one more before we go on a break was um, from Tom asking if you know of any current pest management systems that include spiders. 
there are none formally in the UK, but there's a lot of research at the moment, and I'm involved in some of that research, into developing that potential. So at the moment, for example, pesticides obviously are becoming less uh, and less um, acceptable. And I'm sure you've all heard the concerns about things like the neonicotinoid pesticides and um, uh, the concerns about the, the, the injury, the damage to bees. And what we shouldn't forget is that many of these pesticides, they are also equally harmful to a whole range of other invertebrates. If you encourage spiders in agricultural settings, we actually have good empirical evidence that shows you can significantly reduce the impact of pests, not to the same degree as artificial pesticides, that's true. Um, but the reality is we need to decide, don't we, whether we're comfortable living in a world that is devoid of significant biodiversity, but we've got large crops, um, or if we, we suffer a small reduction in the size of the crops, but actually we have a much healthier, more vibrant world, which is probably going to keep us alive for a lot longer as well. Uh, some of the stuff that I'm going to talk about later will also link to some of the current research that we're looking at into how we can use spiders to support agriculture and to control pests. Where are we? Da, 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 da. So you should all now see the business end of a spider. This is the bit that people don't like quite so much, and I can kind of understand why. Uh, the specimen you can see to the top right of your screens, this is the notorious Sydney funnel web spider. Uh, it is officially the most venomous spider on the planet. Uh, some people will tell you about the Brazilian wandering spider. Uh, the difference is that the Brazilian wandering spider is more dangerous because of where you're likely to be bitten, um, because they tend to live in quite remote areas, um, and also the effectiveness of the, of the anti-venom. Um, the Sydney funnel web, the anti-venom is very, very effective indeed. In fact, you have to go back to 1981 before we had the last fatality from a Sydney funnel web bite. And yet people talk about these in the press like they're, you know, they're, they're murderous killers. They're, they're really not at all. Bit of a shame. Uh, but anyway, you can see this specimen here. The reason I've got this picture is because you can see those fangs really, really clearly. Uh, the fangs are really important for the spider because they're actually, um, they're reliant, like I say, on their venom, not only to help them overcome their prey, but also to convert the prey effectively into a soup that they can, they can drink because um, they, they literally aren't capable of, of eating solids. They do need to suck on, um, on liquid foods. So we can see these, these rather impressive fangs. Uh, I actually have a, a pair of fangs in my laboratory at work, which I wish I'd brought home before lockdown because I could have shown you them now um, uh, from the uh, Therophosa blondi, which is the largest spider on the planet. It's the, the um, um, Goliath bird eating spider. And they're as big as cat's claws. You can, you can actually see them, but they're much harder and sharper than cat's claws. And that's because they're their key role in terms of prey capture. If you have a look um, at a spider's fang, you can see the electron micrograph at the bottom. Um, and it's just underneath the, um, the text. So I'm going to stop talking in a minute. But if you have a look just about where the text is, you'll see a tiny little slit. That's where the venom leaves. Excellent. OK. Um, you can see there's a, a simple graphic here. For large spiders like the Sydney funnel web, uh, they, they belong to the same group as what most people call modern tarantulas. The poison gland itself is contained only within this part, that's the chelicera. But in modern spiders, in the spiders we have in the UK, the poison gland is much bigger relative to the spider and actually, actually goes into the head part of the spider as well. Having said that, there are no spider species in the UK capable of causing any significant harm whatsoever to humans. Don't believe all the panic about false widows. Nobody has ever died from a false widow bite. Uh, and in fact, the, the stories of, of amputations and all of the other things that you'll see, um, they're, they're nonsense. In fact, a significant part of my time goes to um, fact checking and complaining about those various and frequent media stories. Uh, most cases you can see this is uh, typically something like a splinter which has got infected uh, or an insect bite. 
Uh, the characteristic you'll see, we have two fangs on a spider, which will lead a lot of people to tell you that you can always recognize a spider bite because you see two punctures, a double puncture wound. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard that before. Double puncture wound must be a spider. It's, is it nonsense? It's kind of nonsense, actually, because it's true they leave a double puncture wound. But for most spiders, the fangs are so close together that it's almost indistinguishable that you have two puncture wounds. You'd really need a very, very good lens to see that there were two at all. Um, whereas actually double puncture wounds from insect bites are very, very common, even though insect bites come from a single bite. And the reason for this is if you imagine a blood sucking insect, it takes a blood meal, it gets disturbed, but then it wants to resume its meal. It will put in the puncture probably pretty much right next door to the first one that it made, but never in exactly the same place. So very frequently when pe people are bitten by biting insects, they get a characteristic double puncture, which is not from a spider. It's so frustrating because like I say, it's, it's true, they do leave double puncture wounds, but you generally can't see their double and biting insects do it all the time. Um, so yeah, very frustrating. Anyway, the, the fangs, not very pleasant for some people to look at, but they are really important for the spiders in terms of securing their prey and also for manipulating their prey as well. At the bottom right, you can see these weird comb-like structures. Um, and actually these are um, in the mouth parts of the spider. You'll remember I said earlier, they can't eat solid food. They really do need it as a liquid soup. And I mean, one of those thin soups, not, not a nice chunky vegetable soup or anything like that. Um, and what these filters are for, literally they're filtering out any solid parts that they've not yet fully um, liquefied from the venom. So any solid parts get caught up in the filters that we can see here. Uh, and then the spider will get rid of that as a solid um, lump. You'll often see uh, all web spiders will leave um, lumps of carapaces and bits like that that have been chewed, but no solids can they take in. They literally just suck up the fluids, filter out even little particles and then get rid of them. Very, very clean animals, like I said earlier. There are sometimes unusual uses for venom. Uh, we, we were speaking about unusual prey capture earlier uh, with a question about um, the, uh, the net casting spiders. Um, this is even more unusual. This is the spitting spider, Cytodes thoracica. We do get this species in the UK. They're quite secretive, but you, you, you can sometimes see them on windowsills in the evening and in old houses and places like that. Um, and they don't really have a venomous bite. What they do have is um, venom that they can squirt so they can shoot it out of their fangs forward. Um, and the, um, that venom is, is also like a glue. So if you look at the top left, you can see there's a fly here and you can see this zigzag, like uh, little lines going across the screen. And that's the venom that the spider has shot out of its fangs and it judders its body backwards and forwards as it does that. So it sprays the venom in strands across and it covers the prey, it glues it down to whatever surface the prey is walking on and then the spider can go in, finish it off and feed on it. It's a very, very different mode of prey capture. No silk involved in that one, but there is still glue. I mentioned earlier some spiders have been discovered to feed on insect eggs. This was, um, this is a specimen, this is not a British species actually, this is Hylus semicupreus, which is uh, a tropical spider. This was work um, that I've been doing with a colleague of mine in, um, in India, and this is an amazing discovery. For us this is really important. So we can see here, this is a, a female spider, I think she's kind of cute and I hope you'll agree with me. And you can see what, what we have here are a series of eggs. So these are eggs laid by a Koraid bug. And these bugs are really rampant um, pests of agricultural crops. They're a huge problem. Now, until relatively recently, it was believed that spiders, if they couldn't see prey moving or feel it struggling, they weren't aware that it was potential prey. So the thought was that they would leave things like eggs alone. But as we can see here, 
she's certainly not doing that. She's munching her way through these eggs. And we now have excellent evidence that this and a number of other related species are um, what we call oophagous. They feed on eggs if they get the opportunity. We believe that they're locating them through, uh, they, they, they've got excellent eyesight, you can see the large eyes, but they're principally using taste. So one amazing thing about spiders is they have, um, they have sense of taste in their feet. I always think this would be great for kids because uh, I certainly remember when I was a kid, you know, you have the, the argument with your parents. No, I don't want to eat that. And, and you know, your mum or dad would say to you, I, you know, you've got to at least try it. Well, if you're a spider, trying it just means touch it. And if you touch it, you can go, no, I don't like that. You don't have to put the filthy stuff in your mouth. Uh, I always thought that's a really, really handy adaptation. For spiders, it's really important because their ability to recognise their prey by taste, their eyesight, remember, often not being that great, and this one's an exception, um, is really important. So wasps, for example, taste slightly different. If they touch prey and it tastes wrong, they'll get rid of it, they'll let it go, because it's a real danger to them. Um, so that sense of taste in the feet is really important to them. And we believe that's what she does. So she may use visual cues, but then once she gets close enough, she's touching them and she can taste. And you can see um, the way that her legs are positioned here, particularly this one. She just caresses the eggs and we think she's getting that taste. Oh, that's insect egg. Why am I so excited about this? Well, one of you was asking about agriculture earlier. So most of the time, spiders, if we imagine what they're doing is they're feeding on mobile adult insects. And mobile adult insects have already matured. They're already active potentially as pests on crops. Um, so by the time a spider catches them, they've already done some damage potentially. But eggs haven't even hatched. So the wonderful thing about eggs is when a spider encounters a batch of eggs like this, it will eat the lot. It will clear the lot out in one go. Not only that, those are pests which will never grow to maturity to be pests for that particular crop. So the potential impact of egg eating spiders as potential natural pesticides is even greater than for spiders with normal tastes. They're amazing animals and we're exploring their potential for agricultural uses right now. We believe there are species around the world that do things like this. It's just that, you know, there's so much we still need to discover about them. And whilst we're talking about unusual diets for spiders, yes, there are spiders out there that even like their fruit and veg. So uh, again, this is a tropical species. This is Bacchiria. spider and you can see what calls these little orange bits at the end they're very very rich um, in sugars and in fats and Bakira kipling eye and a number of other species we've identified will actually collect vegetable matter and feed on it as long as it's rich enough and energetic enough they'll do that some of them we believe may have an almost exclusively vegetarian diet so you know we're, we're changing our view on spiders almost day by day extraordinary animals Now on to courtship. Courtship is one of the most interesting things that you can observe in terms of spider behaviour. They have the, the most amazing behaviours associated with it. We can see a couple of them here. So if we look top left, you can see two jumping spiders, the male and the female. They look quite different, don't they? And that's one of the reasons actually why we're, um, we're still changing our understanding of many spider species. So some spider species which have been identified, for example, in the tropics, um, have been identified as separate species. Today, when we study them, when we go and observe them in the wild, we realize that actually people have misclassified male and female as different species. You watch them together and they're two different sexes. So, um, you know, actually the fact that our number of spider species keeps going up and up and up, that's despite the fact that we've actually discovered some species that we thought were separate are the same. What that means is there is a raft of new species out there to be discovered. There's a raft of new species worldwide. And also, I said to you earlier that our species count in the UK is 670 plus. There are new species being discovered in the UK. They're not new to science, but they're new to this country. So somebody with a keen eye 
and a passion for this may well make their name. Anyway, back to courtship. The female, you can spot, can't you? Look at the size of that abdomen, a big, fat, juicy abdomen in comparison to that rather pathetic little male. Now, he needs to be very careful on approaching the female. Male spiders are invariably smaller than the female, sometimes by a little bit, sometimes by quite a lot. What that means is every male spider is a potential meal for the female. And given that their, one of their triggers is movement, you have to be very careful approaching a potential mate. And you can see that's exactly what he's doing here. So he's raised his two forelegs and he's using these and he's going to signal and he's going to wave and he's going to dance. And he puts the right um, visual cues to the female and she's judging him basically on, on how good a dancer he is. If he does the right moves, she may even consent to mate with him. If he does the wrong moves, she's going to go for him. And if he does the right moves, but not quite well enough, she's probably still going to go for him. So you, know, you really do have to be quite careful as a male spider. Uh, we can see down at the bottom wolf spiders, lycosid spiders, uh, and you can see the same again. This is the female. Uh, you can see that she's slightly larger, again, slightly larger abdomen. It's less clear in the, in the wolf spiders, though you can still see. And the male, you can see he's rising up. He's quite high on his legs and he uses these pedipalps. He'll do semaphore with his pedipalps to send out those signals. And he'll sometimes, I don't know whether this will come through on the microphone or not, but he'll sometimes drum as well. And that drumming is a vibration cue. But what do you do if you want to court a female who lives in the centre of a web? Vibration is her cue. So you use that vibration. Spiders serenade. So a male spider wanting to court with a female in her web, in order to get into her web, he will serenade her. He will pluck on the strings at the side of her web, serenading her with the right vibrations at the right frequency so that, that basically she's going, well, I like his tune. And she will serenade him back. She'll pluck the strings to say, it's all right, you can come in. Um, the sad end to this story, of course, is that if a male spider finds a female spider that's not been mated and he plays his cards right, he will probably be able to mate with her okay and he'll get away. But, and ladies, this may appeal to you, actually, um, if he tries his luck and isn't faithful to the original female that he mated with, the more he plays the field, the greater the likelihood that he'll come across a female who has already mated. And when spiders mate, they leave a plug inside her epigyne, which prevents other males from mating. That's a way of making sure it's their sperm that fertilise her. She knows she can't mate again. He doesn't know she's already mated. Now what you have is a male serenading to say, how's about it? Who's actually only good for one thing. So she'll send back the right signals late in the season. It's not uncommon for the occasional male spider to meet his demise uh, in the parlour of the female. But then again, they don't tend to live for much longer. So at least it, it's a, a worthwhile way to end. In Australia, the redback spider is even more bizarre because the male spider is not going to survive that first mating. In fact, he does something quite amazing during mating. He will actually flip his own body in between her jaws partway through mating. He does what we call a copulatory somersault. He basically gives himself to her and says, go on then, my dear, you may partake. And we believe this is because it gives his eggs, his, his sperm rather, an increased chance. Actually, females who feed on the males, they tend to have more and stronger offspring than those that don't. So there you go. Uh, the male has to start this off, of course, with charging his pedipalps. So those pedipalps, those large swollen bulbs at the front, um, he actually uses those to suck up sperm. And he does that by, you can see at the top diagrams of two sperm webs. He'll weave a very, very small web. He deposits a drop of sperm on the web from his own genitals. And then he uses his pedipalp over the top to suck it up. It inflates like a bulb. And it's that that he inserts into the female. And because of that unique structure, 
each species is like a lock and a key. So they're unique. And that's why we use their genitalia for species ID if their external appearance isn't enough. And you can actually see that amazing act here. So these are long-jawed spiders. They're very common in the UK. This is Tetragnatha. Uh, you often see them around water. You can also see them in your back garden. They like lying on grass and things like that because they put their legs out and they can literally look like a blade of grass. The female, as usual, is the larger you can see here. A couple of interesting things to note. You can see he's got his large fangs out here and he's not doing that aggressively. Far from it. He's actually using his fangs to hold hers open so she can't get to him. So he's literally pinning her fangs so that she doesn't get tempted to take a bite of him whilst he's mating. And then you can see one of his pedipalps here. Can you see that in about the middle of the shot? It's like a, a strand, like a little leg between him and her. And if you look at the end of it, the base of her abdomen, can you look? It's like an inflated balloon. And that's full of the sperm. So as he contracts the muscles in that bulb, that releases the sperm into her epigyne and fertilizes her. Some spiders go to extraordinary lengths. I mentioned Pisora mirabilis, the nursery web spider, to you earlier. Here we have a beautiful male specimen. Uh, wonderful rich colors to him. You can see there. You can't see his pedipalps very well. They're kind of tucked underneath. Nursery web spiders have a bit of a problem. Their females don't make a web. Their eyesight is okay, but it's not the best. So they're at, they're at quite high risk if they approach the female and they don't get it quite right. They'll still do the normal courtship, but male Pisora mirabilis or male nursery web spiders actually have perfected giving gifts to their female. And they wrap them up as well, just like they should, of course. So the male will capture a small prey item. Um, small but juicy, and he'll wrap that painstakingly. He won't feed on it himself, and he will then offer that to the female, like a box of chocolates. Um, uh, the basic idea is that she'll be too interested in feeding on that than on him. What do you do if you're a male and you can't find prey that you think is good enough to keep her occupied? Well, Pisor mirabilis will take this to extreme lengths, and in fact, a male who is getting close to the end of his life and needs to mate, but can't find prey, will actually take off one of his own legs and wrap that up and offer that to her. He will literally give his own right arm to mate. That's dedication for you, I think you will agree. Uh, once he's successfully mated, he will make good and scarper as quickly as he can. We can see the female here. You can see her abdomen looks a little bit smaller. This is because she's, um, her eggs have developed and then she's uh, released her eggs onto, a, on, onto a, uh, a silken mat, which she then folds up to make a ball. So this is her egg sac. You can always spot Pisora mirabilis females because they carry their egg sac underneath. You'll see wolf spiders, they have their egg sacs on the tip of their abdomen like a little ball. But the nursery of spiders, she carries hers underneath her like this. It looks quite ungainly. She really treasures it and looks after it until it develops and until those tiny little spiderlings emerge. And when they do, they construct a nursery web just like this. And these are the structures that I told you that if you look out for in June and July, you'll start to see around grasslands and countryside in the UK quite regularly. In fact, if you find a, a field where you get these at all, you will find them everywhere. There's a, a field where I walk my dog. And in the summer months, uh, June, July, uh, as I walk across there, um, I count the nursery webs that I can see on either side um, as the, the footpath goes straight through the field. And I can count 80 to 100, literally just along the length of the footpath that goes through the field and they would be distributed evenly throughout the field. So you're looking at hundreds of thousands of them across just one field alone. Quite extraordinary. The spiderlings will live in there for two to three weeks and she will continue to guard it. She's a really, really good mother. She really looks after her offspring. And eventually when they're large enough to fend for themselves, they'll disperse. Here's another example. 
Are these uh, at the top, we can see some little spiderlings. The bottom left, black and yellow, very characteristic. Look out for these late spring and in the summer and again towards the autumn. There's usually two batches in a year. These are the spiderlings of the garden cross spider or the, the typical garden spider. And they're black and yellow, like a wasp. They can't bite, they're far too small for that. Um, but the black and yellow, it does serve a purpose. It's warning coloration. You remember I said that most spiders are not poisonous, but they are venomous. Well, some spiderlings are the exception. So the spiderlings for the garden cross spider, they're completely helpless. They can't defend themselves in any way, but they concentrate a poison within their body tissues. So that if animals were to feed on them, it makes them ill. Um, and that's what the black and the yellow coloration is for. It's a visual warning that I am poisonous. Don't eat me. It's not good for you. That coloration is lost as they get larger. They actually lose the poison as well because they, they, they develop strategies. They hide in, in little retreats at the corner of their webs. And they're much more tricky to get when they're in the web anyway. Um, but anyway, the black and yellow, very characteristic. Look out for it. Has anybody seen these in the wild? and ever disturbed them. If you disturb them in the wild, they look like they explode. And that's because all the little spiderlings will crawl to the furthest parts of the web away from one another. They all go in different directions and that's because it creates confusing spectacle that confuses the predators, makes it difficult for them to focus on any one. Um, and then after time, it doesn't take them that long, give them you know, a minute or two, and you'll notice they all start to come back together again, back into the cluster. It's a very characteristic behaviour. As I've said before, spiders make fantastic parents. They're really, really good mothers, actually. Um, so on the top left, you can see wolf spider. This is a female wolf spider. Her abdomen looks a little bit strange, a little bit lumpy. If you look closely, you can see those are the spiderlings. So she will carry them for several days on her abdomen um, and she will tend them. She will look after them ever so well. These ones are very recently out because you can see the remnants of the egg sac just here at the bottom of that photograph. Looks like a sort of deflated um, beach ball. That's the remnants of the egg sac. But she'll carry them with her. I saw some really upsetting stories in the newspapers last year, actually. Um, where these were reported as horror stories. Somebody touched a spider and its, its abdomen exploded and tiny spiders all came out in all directions. It was horrific. No, nothing exploded. That's a mum looking after her babies. You've disturbed her and the babies are running for their lives. You know, it, it's, it's just that the misrepresentation is such a shame. Um, below we can see the mother care spider, Phylonita. Uh, she's amazing. She's one of those tangle web spiders I told you about, uh, and she's quite incredible. Actually, she'll look after her offspring. She will regurgitate some of her own food for them and feed them from her mouth parts over their first few days to give them a bit of a head start in life before they can handle prey on their own. So not for nothing is she called the mother care spider. The dark end of that story, of course, is that she's not going to survive uh, for much longer herself. So at about the time her young are getting ready to leave the nest, the mother spider dies of natural causes. And the spiderling's last meal before leaving the nest will be to feed on her carcass. But nevertheless, a great mother, I think you'll agree. We can see some examples of molting here. Obviously, spiders, in order to be able to grow, uh, they have this rigid exoskeleton. They need to molt. I'm sure you're familiar with ecdysis or molting in insects. Spiders are really, really vulnerable during this stage. Their, their abdomens are soft anyway, but during molting, the whole body is soft. So many spider species will do this suspended by a piece of silk, as you can see in the photograph from Pisora mirabilis. If you're suspended in midair, it's very difficult for most predators to be able to get at you. Um, they're really, really vulnerable. It takes a while then for the, the chitin on the exoskeleton to harden. Um, so it's a, it's a really, really um, dangerous period of life for, uh, for a spider. It's an amazing thing to see if you ever get the chance, though. It is quite beautiful, weirdly beautiful, if you get to see it. 
And then, of course, with the spiderlings, once they're ready to leave the nest, they do this amazing dispersal. So launching linifieds, these are the money spiders that, that we spoke about earlier. You can just see they have this instinct to crawl to the tip of the tallest item that they can find. They raise their abdomen into the air and they release a stream of silk. And they wait for the merest breeze to catch that and that will lift them and carry them. They actually form something we call aerial plankton, which I think is a beautiful, beautiful phrase. You can find them way, way up into the, into the atmosphere. Um, you know, you, we can sample them actually aerially from aircraft. Uh, and like I say, they can travel hundreds of miles uh, via ballooning. And this means that they can disperse widely uh, across the available habitat. And most spider species will do this. You can see a wolf spider doing this as well. Uh, you can, if you ever get a spiderling on you in ballooning season, um, if you get it on your hand, raise your hand so the fingers are uppermost and you will watch them. They'll crawl up to the tip of the finger and then they just raise the abdomen, as you can see this one doing here. And it's just wonderful as you watch them and you can sometimes see those little strands of silk, wait for the air to catch them. And then they suddenly just let go with their legs and off they go. It's a beautiful thing to behold. And when they go, they go in numbers. So, I mean, I'm sure, you know, if you've ever been out early in the morning, you've seen this on a dewy morning, the sheer amount of uh, cobwebs that we can see here. Most of this in, in the summer would be from ballooning spiders that have settled. Some of these are sheet webs as well. But just imagine the sheer number of spiders that we have in a field like this and how many invertebrates and insects they're able to process. And spiders, remember, they don't tend to go very far either. Many of them are located with their webs or their little retreats. So they're actually easier for many other larger predators to find. So actually, if we lost spiders from our ecosystem, it would devastate the biodiversity for higher tiers in our food web, which of course includes birds, small mammals, and, and so many other things besides. Spiders are a really important link taxon in terms of funneling the energy from invertebrates to those higher levels. We can see some other examples actually of just the, the sheer diversity of spiders and the, the wonderful spectacles you get in ballooning season. Well, well worth looking closer at some of these. Uh, I do strongly recommend, you know, once we get into late spring and early summer, uh, actually going out early in the morning, uh, just after sunup and looking at the dew uh, uh, and the wonderful sort of cobwebbing um, across the fields. It's, it's a wonderful sight. What am I doing for time? <laughs> okay. So if you're finding this interesting, if I'm beginning to, or hopefully, I mean, you, you guys are all here, actually. So you're obviously interested in spiders, at least curious at this stage. If you want to take it further, if you want more spider facts, please do look up the British Arachnological Society. We are the, uh, the country's only charity devoted exclusively to the study and understanding of arachnids. I've put the website for uh, the British Arachnological Society on here, britishspiders.org.uk. Uh, there's a lot of information on there, including information on spider ID, uh, which is all free. You can access all of that free of charge. Membership, uh, I can't remember exactly how much it is. That's dreadful. I think it's about £23 a year at the moment for a year. Uh, it's open to everyone from the, um, the most novice beginners right through to professional academic arachnologists. Uh, we hold a number of different field trips and um, field courses throughout the year as well. Um, and uh, you know, lots of opportunities for people to go and study spiders with other people who are passionate about them too. So do, do look that up. Lots of information there for debunking the myths as well. Uh, we publish a journal uh, called Arachnology and a newsletter. Uh, this is published uh, three times a year. Um, and is full of interesting facts. And again, you can see one of our field visits there. The other thing that the British Arachnological Society does is we manage something called the Spider Recording Scheme. 
Uh, so for any of you who are interested in the impacts of climate change, for example, on British biodiversity, um, actually there's some really great data on the spider recording scheme. It's all completely free to access. You can get to it through the British Arachnological Society website. Um, if you sign up for the sp spider recording scheme, you can submit your own records as well uh, to the area coordinators and each of those records accounts for a dot on the map, as you can see here. Uh, the lovely thing about it is you can search different years. So this is the distribution of the wasp spider, Argaea P. Bruinicki, um, and you can see in the late 90s, uh, relatively limited distribution, principally on the south coast. But you can see 2018, how many more sightings we're getting now and how they're marching steadily more northwards. You can see the same for the, uh, the false widow spider and also for species like the cellar spider, um, actually which, if you go back to the 90s, again were limited to the south coast and now actually have spread right up in some cases into Scotland as well. And a lot of this is because of um, climate change. So, for example, for the false widow, it does require slightly warmer conditions. Um, but also, um, we're getting better records these days as well, so we shouldn't discount that. Um, but it is, it's, it's actually got some really, really useful data. You can see some species gradually, gradually marching north. You can see other species becoming more and more scarce, which is, is not something that we like to see. If I were to tell you that nearly 20% of our UK spider fauna is um, considered to be endangered, or vulnerable. Now that will give you some idea of the extinction threat right under our noses for species that many people are not even aware of. It's around about 16-17% of our species, so approaching 20% are vulnerable or endangered in the UK. And these are often species that people think are relatively common or even things that they've never heard of and they're disappearing on our watch. And the ecological consequences of losing these animals could be quite profound. Remember, they've, they've structured the evolution of terrestrial life for as long as we've been able to chart in the fossil record. To lose them would be unconscionable, let alone you know, potentially disastrous for the continued healthy functioning of our ecosystems. And that's where I'm going to finish, really, with why we should care about spiders. They really are profoundly important as a fundamental part of our natural world. They're essential predators, but they're also really important as food for other species. There are lots of species which specialise in feeding on spiders. There are plenty of other species which will happily snap up a spider if they can find them. Um, and remember, the sheer quantity of invertebrate prey that they're actually processing day by day, year on year, the fact that they can contribute significantly in terms of pest control, potentially, and I gave you some examples of that earlier. But also the fact that they're doing that, you know, without anybody even paying a second thought to them most of the time. We should care about them because spider silk is of increasing interest in medical research. Spider venom is receiving interest for research into insecticides, but also for pharmaceutical treatments as well. Some spider venoms have um, an ability to bust clots, so they can be used as clot busters for the treatment of, for example, stroke. Uh, others could be used to break down tumours, so for treatment for uh, various diseases, various cancers. Um, others could be used for effects against different bacteria or viruses. The, the pharmaceutical uses of spider venom, we're only just beginning to scratch the surface. And we're doing this as we're becoming aware of how many species are, are teetering on the brink of extinction. There are species today that have yet to be discovered and identified formally that will be extinct tomorrow. And that's worth thinking about. One of my colleagues in the Natural History Museum uh, has rafts of specimens which have been collected in the 19th and 20th centuries, many of which have not yet been identified because there's so much still to go through. And when we get the opportunity to have a look at these specimens, we identify still to this day new species from collections that were made decades ago. And sometimes we're identifying species that are already extinct in the wild. How disheartening is that? We didn't even know the role of some of these species ecologies 
and they've gone. And yet there is still so many live species for us to discover. My colleague uh, Javed in India, I do quite a lot of collaboration with him. Um, he's constantly bringing uh, new species for us to be able to study, to identify uh, and to publish. And there are plenty more out there as well. The tropics are always a good source uh, of, of new species for us. But there are so many others, like I say, species that have gone under the radar. And finally, spiders and their architecture, their amazing silken webs, they give pleasure to so many. They're so underrated. Um, I, would, I would heartily recommend that um, they're worth your time, they're worth your study. If you delve a little bit deeper into the world of spiders, you will find, I think, very, very quickly that you become utterly won over by them. They're in their way gentle, vulnerable, very, very sensitive to the merest vibrations. They're um, so critically important to us and yet so maligned. And the United Kingdom sits at the hub of misinformation about spiders worldwide. This is a, a research project I'm working on at the moment, and it's, it's, it's really quite frightening. If I tell you that we've processed in the realm of about 3,000 news articles from around the world that present misinformation about spiders, more than half of those came from the UK. And that's with 31 different countries involved. It's frightening. And we need to stop it. We need to change our attitude to these animals. We need to hold people to account when they spread misinformation and they encourage people to feel fear for animals that not only are so important to us, but are actually increasingly under threat. So, ladies and gentlemen, we are almost finished. Uh, opportunity for any questions before I come to my finishing slide. Can't hear you. Sorry, got a couple of questions in the chat. From okay, people. far away. Um, so Daniel was asking, have you ever encountered a Sydney funnel web spider to work with one? No, I haven't. You know, Australia is one of the one of those countries that is absolutely top of my list to go to. I would love to. I have a colleague who actually works with them. Um, and I've got another colleague who works in, um, in Australia with some of those giant orb web spiders that we saw earlier that were, were responsible for the silk that made the dress and, and so on and so forth. But I've never had the opportunity to work with a Sydney funnel web, no. I would love to. I think they're amazing. <laughs> um, and what we've got, um, so Al was asking if you released an egg eating spider into a field with um, abundant insect eggs, would they remain there or would they kind of move on? OK, so um, we're looking at species that are wanderers. So the jumping spiders do wander, but they don't wander that far. So what they do is they make a, a retreat for themselves that they'll hide in when they're not actively hunting. They leave that retreat uh, during the day because um, jumping spiders are spiders that have particularly good eyesight. So they, they primarily hunt during the day, uh, but they, they won't go that far. So they may range, um, you know, quite a long way for a spider, but they'll stay in the field, definitely. And what we're interested in, rather than releasing spiders into the fields, is actually finding out which species in our natural ecology naturally have those behaviours and then encouraging them into the fields by, um, um, if you like, agricultural um, architecture. So I mentioned earlier the, the sort of bivouacs that historical Chinese farmers were using in their fields and at their field margins. That's the sort of thing that we really want to see more of. And that way that the local spider fauna will move in. We won't need to, we won't need to move them in and release them. They're already there. We just need to encourage them. And that's an amazing thing about spiders is they won't stay in a place that isn't profitable for them. If you have a spider that's located where there are the wrong prey or simply not enough prey, they'll move, they'll go somewhere else. They'll disperse. Um, web, web, web building spiders will change websites. They won't be able to go very far, but they'll adjust the height of the web or they'll move a few feet to one side and they'll try their luck there and see if they can get a better hit rate. Um, so they're not gonna leave the field, but they will come to the field if we encourage them. 
Uh, then Becca was asking, um, are there any species of spider which lives and hunts below the ground that are just uh, in the soil? Just in the soil? Yes, there are, actually. There are, there are some amazing species that do that. Uh, there are some that predate on ants, which will go into the ant burrows. That's a really, really specialist practice. Um, because ants, again, are really dangerous to most spiders. Uh, but there are some there are some species that will um, emit the same smell as ants to fool the ants and they'll go down into the ants burrows and they'll feed on them there there are others most spiders tend to act above the ground and the most the richest area for spiders like i say is that area of topsoil and the low vegetation i think one of the most amazing things that that i've done i went um to do some data collection for field work for a research project uh, after we'd had snowfall um, in the depths of December, this was a couple of years ago, and I wasn't holding out much hope that I'd get anything, particularly because I'm, I'm working with a suction sampler, which is, is basically a leaf blower in reverse with a special bag attached to it. And what I was sucking up was snowballs. I put the snowballs into my tray and I, I melt the snow. So I, I literally had to lean over them, break them apart with my hands and then breathe on the snow. And then I'd back off and I'd get my eye lens and I'd put that down and I'd see if I can see any spiders within the ice. And then you'd see something and you'd breathe on that again. And just the warmth of your breath was enough to gradually melt the snow. And you could see the spiders coming alive, waking up from being in the frost. They'd start to move their legs. And then once it was completely melted, they'd, they'd spring to life. And quite slowly, because it was cold, they'd move and I could collect them. It amazed me just how many spiders you can collect underneath snow in the middle of the winter. So you will get some in the soil, um, in burrows, uh, but mostly the, the predation behavior tends to be in the, the bottom layer of the vegetation and the top layer of the soil where there's a bit of air space. And it's thriving. Then we've got one from Daniel saying, uh, in the prehistoric era, were spiders much bigger due to the oxygen rich environment? And I'm curious as to know how big. <laughs> yes, they were bigger. Uh, no, they weren't enormous. No. Um, I mean, we've got we've got some good evidence of some spiders that were a bit larger than the sort of modern day tarantulas. Uh, so some quite large bodies. Um, but actually spiders, even with the enriched oxygen atmosphere, there's a limit to how large they can get. And that's because of the physics um, uh, to do with their, their body size and gravity. Actually, because of their exoskeletons, if they get too large, they're literally crushed by the gravity. They can't move freely. So they did get a bit bigger, um, but not the giant spiders that you see in the movies, I'm afraid. <laughs> we don't. <laughs> um, then we've got um, oh, a really good question say, asking, if spiders have poor eyesight, do spiders in the same habitat develop different courtship rituals to prevent them courting the wrong species? Oh, yes, absolutely they do. Yeah, so very, very, some, if they're closely related species, um, their, their, their dances can still be really remarkably different. It's quite amazing. So I showed you the semaphore earlier that they do with their front legs or with their commonly with their paddy palps. And they'll do they'll do a whole raft of different moves. Each set of behaviors is unique to species. So, yeah, absolutely. And, and very, very different. Um, you know, the more different the species, the more different the behaviors. Um, and then another one from Becca asking, do um, species of spider go into a dormancy state over winter? Um, yes, but less so than we imagined. Uh, like I say, it's, it's surprising when you go spidering in the winter, just how many active spiders you find. Uh, the ones I was referring to in the snowballs, the only reason that they weren't active was because they'd been sucked up and compacted in a snowball. But if you can imagine, if you have a look, um, there's a warm layer um, underneath the frost and underneath the snow where there's still a lot of activity going on. Um, you can go out on, on frosty January nights um, and if you take a torch with you, you can get that eye shine. Uh, you can find the webs typically from things like walnut spiders. The more we study them, the more we realize how many of them remain active through the winter. That said, 
there are species that um, that overwinter, and moreover, there are a lot um, that leave spiderlings um, in um, that um, overwinter as spiderlings, and then they become active the next spring. So yes, but actually, we're beginning to learn that they're more active than we ever thought in the winter. Um. Then one from Tanya asking, is there anything that we can then we can do to encourage spiders in the garden? Oh, great question. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, I mean, I suppose it's all the usual things that you would do for wildlife anyway. Anywhere where we can encourage what I call structural diversity is good. So that is where we get plants of different heights. So if you have a if you if you've just got, say, a, a grass lawn and you keep that mown very, very short all the time, that's not really good for, for much wildlife. Um, but if you've got areas of your lawn where you allow the grass to be a bit longer, or if you've got um, flower beds where you've got a bit more structural diversity, that all encourages spiders. Um, I think um, what would be good? Garden sheds are amazing for spiders. Compost heaps are fantastic as well because they, you know, they they, they tend to retain quite a lot of warmth. They also draw in a lot of other organisms but structural diversity so having lots of different plants in your garden is good varying the length of grass if you've got space to do that is good if you've only got a small garden you don't even need any grass um, just having plants um, some with woody stems is good so they've got solid structures um, yeah anything like that is good but more than anything encourage invertebrates into your garden if the invertebrates come if you've got if you've got um, flies and beetles and butterflies and all of these other things coming into your garden the spiders will come they will come they will follow the prey awesome has anyone got any other questions i think that looks like it's it for questions um, well, I'd just like to say thank you very much to all of you. Uh, I hope you hope you found something new about spiders that you possibly didn't know before this evening. And, um, you know, if, if any of you choose to take your study of spiders a little bit further, I'm always happy to be contacted and, you know, I'd be happy to point you in the right direction. If we get the opportunity to do a field course, I'd be delighted to take you guys out uh, to show you how to, to collect spiders safely without harming them and to be able to you know to go and get hands on with these amazing animals